Hi, I'm Kevin Rhodes. Welcome to Expositions. William Hazlitt wrote in On Great and Little Things in Literary Remains, if you think you can win, you can win. Faith is necessary to victory. However, this is hardly what the Apostle John had in mind when he wrote in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. To overcome the world is to not allow its influence to determine who you are and what you do. Earlier in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, John wrote, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereby, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. But in order to overcome the world's influence, that means you must embrace God's influence. Our faith is the victory because when we engraft God's Word into our minds and make it our own way of thinking, what we truly believe, our worldview, we then take on aspects of God's own character so that we truly are His children. The loving obedience John mentioned in verse 3 of John 5 is not burdensome at all because it is doing what God tells us that enables us to rise above the mores of society in order to triumph spiritually. Therefore, the means of this spiritual victory that enables us to rise above society's mores is our trust in what God says. And that's where we need to turn if we want the victory. So now as we begin looking at the passage that follows that one verse of verse 4 in 1 John 5, we're going to notice some things that are so important in what assures us of victory. And remember that the entire book of 1 John has essentially the two themes. He guides us through the ideas of love both from God and what we need in our own lives, and how these bring about fellowship. And these two combine to give us great assurance. And that's what 1 John truly gets across to us, and the message I hope you've seen through this series. So as we look at verses 5 and the first part of verse 6 of 1 John chapter 5, we see this. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of Christ assures us of victory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, it says, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was victorious over the world and has shown the way for us to be victorious as well, which is why we need to look to him as our example in all things. For even here in two were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was, remember, quoting from Isaiah in the context of his suffering, his going to the cross, and even then he showed us you can do right and you can be victorious. But that means we need to be victorious over temptation and sin. That's overcoming the world. In Hebrews 4 verse 15, it says of Jesus, He was tempted in all points like as unto we, yet without sin. Victorious then He was over Satan and over death. You go to Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who the, through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus secured the victory. And that's why we find here that he is the foundation for our victory and the assurance. It's what he made possible through his sacrifice that gives us such strength moving forward. Well, we think about how this is possible, and it begins by recognizing that the identity of the Messiah made the sacrifice he offered the most valuable gift ever provided. We return again to our text. He 
Who is he who overcomes the world? Who did that? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It is recognizing that what he provided and our trust in what he did, it's essential. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. If you do not accept the deity of Jesus, you have not really accepted Jesus. And this is a message that our world needs to hear. Many people, they accept the teachings of Jesus in some kind of generic way as a philosopher, or they will accept Jesus as a savior to some degree, but they do not even accept that Jesus truly is deity. And yet in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. If you do not accept that Jesus also is the Messiah, the word when it says he is the Christ in verse 6, then you have not really accepted Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, when Jesus asked, whom do men say that I am? And the apostles begin to answer, and they give answers like you're, you're Elias, you're John the Baptist, one of the prophets. And he says, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, thou art the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, essential to recognize Jesus in all the roles, in all his identity, so that we totally accept him for who he is, so that we can accept what he did for us. But part of this also is to recognize one more aspect of Jesus. Because if you do not accept the humanity of Jesus, you've not really accepted Jesus either. And that's part of what our text is getting across because he did come. He came and became a man. If you drop down further in John chapter 1 to verse 14, it says of this word who was in the beginning and was God, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so in Jesus, he combines deity, eternal deity, but also with flesh, that is, becoming man. So that Paul could say in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If we do not accept the whole of Jesus, of who he was in every aspect, of what it means for him to be God and man, and that he is indeed the Messiah who fulfilled the old scriptures, that through these things he became Lord, and therefore he is our master and he is our teacher, and that means we have to accept also what he taught. If we're not willing to accept the whole of him and his message, we truly have accepted nothing. In John 12, verse 48, it says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that last day. And that's why if we turn away from Christ in any way, in any aspect of who he is or what he taught and what he left in the gospel, then we are turning away from the sacrifice he gave in spiritual battle and all that that sacrifice made possible. Again, verse 5, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes, trusts that Jesus is the Son of God. He is truly deity. He is who he said he was. He is the Son who came and showed his character to be divine by being truly and fully obedient to perfection. And therefore you get, as a sacrifice, a man who is God, who is perfect, and that's how he overcame. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, there the writer says, And such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. And therefore, in Hebrews 6 and verse 6, we come down to the problem. Because if they fall away, and that really has the idea of if they're in the situation and they do, to renew them again to repentance, it's just, it's going to be impossible. Why? Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. If you're going to deny Jesus in any aspect of what he claims to be, from Hebrews 6 and verse 6 says, you are putting him to an open shame and you're losing out on the benefits of the sacrifice he gave. So let us stop and consider what that really means. 
As we drop down in verse 6, it says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. And we have to consider what it means that he came by water and blood. But to do that, we have to consider the broader context of Christianity. It's not just talking about, as, as some might think, that, that when he died and they pierced his side, that water came out with the blood. But rather, this is a reference to baptism. Because what he's pointing out is, he didn't just come, notice, and we're going to look at this in a moment, by water, but also by water and by blood. Notice the connection in this, not only by water. It's not just about baptism, but it's about the reality of Jesus coming and shedding His blood. Baptism would have no significance at all if it were not for the very real death of Christ on the cross and the shedding of His blood. If we were just being baptized, as the Gnostics had people do and they recognized, but then they wanted to take all the power out of it by denying that Jesus came in the flesh and therefore that He died in the flesh and that He really gave real blood in a real death. And John was telling them, you've taken all the power and meaning out of baptism when you do that. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Paul asks the question, know you not that he says, as many of you were baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death. And the whole point that, like you were baptized then into his death, the whole point when you move forward is that you need to understand something, that when you did that, you were baptized into Christ, into death, and that's what made it possible. As you attach yourself to him, to rise with him by the same power that made him raise from the dead, that you now can walk by newness of life. It is only the reality of Christ's death on the cross and then the reality of his resurrection from a real death that gives our burial in baptism and then our rising up to walk in newness of life power. Our immersion in water has no power apart from what Christ accomplished. It's not magical water. It's tying ourselves by our obedience to what Jesus accomplished. Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with Him through faith in the operation of God which hath raised him from the dead. That is important to tie those together. All of this matters. But baptism, that water, the meaning of it is essential that we tie it and see it with what Jesus did. It's the reality of his life, the reality of his sacrifice, and the reality of, notice the text, his blood that makes his death have meaning and power, which in turn makes our baptism in water for the remission of our sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, have meaning and power. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross, Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And that's why the blood of bulls and goats, though, could not take away sin, Hebrews 10 verse 4. We needed Jesus. This is not something that we accepted blindly when we were immersed. It is what we accepted before our immersion because He did, in fact, come and die for us. And that's why we die to sin and die with Him so we also can live. But God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ truly died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. That's what gives our baptism such power. Not ourselves, not the water, but our obedience and tying ourselves to our Savior and His death. As we look at the latter portion of verse 6, we note this, And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. He has moved then from the role of Jesus and the assurance we get from the reality of Jesus' death that we can have victory, to now show us through the Spirit that the gospel, having been delivered, assures us of victory as well. This is an important component that we must not overlook. 
In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. There is power in the gospel because of the message it provided, and it's because it's from God that it has power. The Holy Spirit, as the text notes, has provided the testimony regarding God's will by inspiring God's word that we have, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was sent to make known all truth. Jesus promised this, remember, in John 31, verse 32, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But then he promised how it would be delivered when he told the apostles, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come, John 16, verse 13. This includes everything about Jesus that we need to know. That's the message of the gospel. Because earlier in John 15, verse 26, Jesus said, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And then in John 16, verse 8, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Therefore, this includes in this message, this one who bears witness in giving truth, the con condemnation of sin. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23 says. And in John 16 verse 9, he convicts us of sin because they do not believe in me. The gospel gives this message out and says, here's what you ought to believe and here's where you're wrong. And there's a consequence to that. It also includes, though, the revelation of righteousness, as remember Paul said. God's complete plan of salvation. Everything that took on God's part to make man right and what he requires of man so that man can be right. That's righteousness. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And therefore, it includes a declaration of judgment based upon the victory of Christ, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged, John 16 and verse 11. The Spirit's message is truth because His character is truth. He is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you, John 14 and verse 17. Sanctify them through Thy truth, Thy word is truth, John 17, verse 17 says. Here's the means he uses, truth. Why? Because God is light and him is no darkness at all. It's this message that ties us in to God's character from verse John 1, verse 5, because he cannot lie, Titus 1, and verse 2. Only truth leads to victory, which is why any time you pervert the message that's found in here, you do not end up with truth and you cannot have victory, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Only truth has any value in eternity, and that's why we ought to buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, verse 23 says, We can be assured of victory because we can trust the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, This Word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is not just any book. It's the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And the only thing the Holy Spirit inspires is truth. But God has revealed them to us, those who were inspired, through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. The Holy Spirit came and gave a message to men, and they put it together, and that's why we have, through the Holy Spirit, this message. And that's the message that provides us assurance. 
when we know what God says, we know we can have victory because God is giving us truth. Thirdly, we're going to look back through verses 4 through 6 and notice a different theme, and it is this. Obedient faith assures us of victory. So let's read through and see what it says. In Revelation 2 verse 10, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. And so this principle rings true throughout Scripture. But as we note in verse 4, obedient faith separates us from the world and makes us belong to God. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. We have to be those who overcome. We have to have the faith that overcomes, but that means being born of God, and that requires obedience. Hebrews chapter 5, 8 and 9 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Obedience leads us to righteousness. Know ye not that him you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Notice, God made righteousness available and possible and reaching out to us, but we have to respond by obeying righteousness and therefore doing and practicing righteousness. And that's how obedience leads us to holiness. Notice this simple verse. Be ye therefore holy, because I am holy. The character of God is, in its essence, holiness. But if we're to be what God wants us to be, we have to obey Him and seek to be holy. Obedient faith also accepts all that God has revealed. Notice again verse 5. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In Romans 10, verse 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That is, the nature of faith, what it takes to believe, is going to come from the Scriptures, from what He has said. We accept who Jesus is and what He did. Indeed, it's essential from John 8, verse 24, because Jesus said there, Except that ye believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. But we need also to believe His mission was indeed to die on the cross for our sins. And how many people in the world sadly think that wasn't his mission at all? They miss out on the essentiality of his coming for that purpose. And yet in John 3, beginning in verse 15, it put it all of this into context through verse 17. It says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have an eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. We needed a Savior, and God sent us the only Savior that would possibly be able to help. He sent His Son, Jesus. And we need to be appreciative of that and have faith in Him fully as the Son of God if we're going to be able to take advantage of what God's done for us. But we also find about obedient faith in verse 6, the first part. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. Obedient faith causes us to be immersed in water for the remission of our sins. When we truly believe who Jesus is, and therefore we accept what Jesus requires, then we will be baptized because He requires us to do so for the remission of the sins. This is the message that the Holy Spirit, as promised by Jesus, brought in bringing truth to them on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. So in verse 38, as they asked what they needed to do, He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. This is what was required in every case of conversion detailed in the New Testament. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe, there's your faith, with all your heart you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he 
baptized him, immersed him. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 38. But baptism is not the entirety of our obedience. It's the beginning of our obedience. We go back to Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. He emphasized that we were baptized into Christ and we were therefore baptized into his death. But then he moves on and says, we don't leave Jesus in the grave. We are thankful that Jesus rose from the dead, and that's why we also need to rise out of our sins, rise out of our death to our sins, to walk in newness of life. That again requires obedience out of faith. Just before his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, that is, assurance. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now let's read verses 7 and 8 from our text in 1 John 5. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now there is a problem there, and perhaps if you were reading in a version other than the King James or the New King James, you realized it immediately. Because there is part of this passage that actually is not in the vast number of manuscripts. And therefore, really, it should not be considered Scripture, in my opinion. And if I were to look at this again, just from the Greek that appears most places, it would read in this way. Because those who testify are three, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are under the point of being one. The context of this passage itself addresses nothing about the Trinity, but specifically the question of whether or not we can be sure of our salvation. John concludes that we absolutely can be sure when three things come together, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, three things he had just addressed in the previous verses. The Spirit inspired the Word right here so that we could know God's will. We who are Christians, as we've just seen, obeyed that Word by being immersed for the forgiveness of our sins according to God's will. And thirdly, Jesus gave His blood to provide for our forgiveness in order to carry out God's will, and that's what gives our baptism power in responding to the message of inspiration. These three factors all work together and testify to the reality of our salvation. John also wrote in Revelation 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They took their things, and they not only were baptized, but they lived faithfully. That's the message we need today. I'm Kevin Rhodes. Thank you for watching Expositions.